I do think that maybe we're not at the highest stage of capitalism now, meaning for Lenin writing it when he did, he thought highest stage of capitalism means prelude to socialism. That's what he thought that meant. And we're not, we're not there. We're not, there's no prelude to socialism right now. No. What you're about to hear is a conversation with Chris Catrone. This is the first time that Mikey, AKA Michael Downs of the Dangerous Maybe, the leader of the Mikey Downs seminar here at Theory Underground, was able to meet Chris Catrone. It's amazing because they're both regulars here, but this is the first time that they meet. Uh, Mikey doesn't talk a lot in the first segment, but in the second segment, he's going to pick Chris's brains on what is Marxism. Okay. But in this first segment, we're going to get into Gabriel Rockhill, Marxism, anti-imperialism. And I hope that this will lay the groundwork for a more thoroughgoing contradiction conversation or contradiction, as we say, uh, between Catrone and Rockhill, because from my standpoint, I'm just trying to figure out things. Uh, whenever it comes to history, people, I just want to say, not only did the Gulf War never happened, but none of the stuff people are talking about really happened. We live in cyber history now, and it's the CIA's lobby, and there's no point um, arguing over uh, what's been settled. <laughs> but with that said, I'm still open to learning, and I'm curious to find out what all the hype is about. And so, you know, this is step one. Uh, here in Catrone's position. And then hopefully we'll be back soon with Rock Hill, who has said that he'll be able to do some stuff in a month or so. So let's go. But before I play it, I just have to say, Chris Catrone is teaching a course, Intro to Marxism, throughout the month of October 2024 here at Theory Underground. Theory Underground subscribers get half off. If you're interested in the subscriptions uh, or becoming a member or Really just what is Theory Underground? Stick around until the end of the video. Watch the PSA that I've made at the end. It's a great way to get a sense for what we're all about. But for now, the short version is this. Theory Underground is not just a YouTube. It's not just a podcast. It is a lecture course, research seminar, and book publishing platform. Yeah, it's a lot of things. And most of that people don't even see on the YouTube or podcast. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Epic Marathon live stream here at Theory Underground. Uh, this is the keynote uh, sort of double feature here at the end with Chris Catrone and Michael Downs. How you two doing? Good. 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 How are you, Dave? How's it awesome. going? The marathon. It's going pretty good. I feel better than usual. This, this, is, kind of, this is a shorter one for you. You're not as zapped, are you? Yeah, I kind of took it easy, huh? Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, McGowan was saying he always catches the the bad side of Dave. Like I'm always just kind of like, you know, <laughs> yeah. the grumpy, the grumpy side. I hope not. I hope that's not what he meant. But yeah, maybe potentially. Uh, Burn, but I think burnout, the the point <laughs> is, is Mikey usually carries most of it at this point. You know. And so this is the first time you two are meeting. Basically, what we wanted to do was start with the topic that came up last time we had you on, Chris, and then we'll pivot to just Marxism because Mikey has a bunch of questions for you on Marxism, just kind of basic stuff. Um, but before we get into that segment, we want to focus on what came up, Gabriel Rockhill. Gabriel Rockhill and the, the I guess... I don't know if it, if they all belong in the exact same bag, uh, but would there be Michael Parenti and Daniel Tut and Haas are like this sort of constellation uh, along with the Midwestern Marx Institute of Marxists that people often when they when they come by our channel they'll be like oh you guys are kind of like X Y or Z one of these people and then when I look at them I'm like hey I like some of the stuff they say but also I don't really see the resemblance but then I, you brought up Rock Hill. And I've been interested in, in him ever since, and uh, also because some people in the community had asked some questions about, about his work. And then he published an article, I don't know when, but uh, it's about the global theory industry and the Frankfurt School with its CIA connections and, uh, and all this stuff that's very, very intriguing, I think, and people keep bringing it up. So I thought, this is a great conversation. You, you, you wanted to argue with him anyway, 
uh, on some things, but here, this is, you're the, you, you're the Lenin and Adorno guy. Like you have been for years right. here at Theory Underground. So I thought let's summon right. Chris and address this head on. So what, what's your right. thoughts on this, on this piece? All right. So earlier today, um, you discussed this with, um, Eamon Swolitari and Tony from One Dime. And uh, they brought up some things that it would be my first things to say about Rock Hill, which is the Stalinism. And um, not, not that that's a revelation or something, but, um, you know, they're trying to uh, kind of wrestle the Frankfurt School back into the Cold War um, and attribute the currency of the Frankfurt School to the Cold War and you know to anti-communism and uh to also kind of harmonize the frankfurt school with postmodernism. um i mean it's tricky because i feel like there's you know uh i think tony brought this up that rock hill is a kind of ex french theory person mm. who has turned hard against his own intellectual origins and um you know, is is maybe engaged in a massive kind of self criticism exercise, and okay. um, that that's that seems to be the animus of it, but the substance of it is pretty thin. The substance of it is, Horkheimer had dinner with someone who got money from the CIA, or you know something like that, and um, you know, and not that there aren't some textual pieces of evidence with which to indict Adorno and Horkheimer and maybe Marcuse about the East Bloc, the the Soviet Bloc and China and Vietnam um, in the Cold War context in the 50s and 60s. Um, but, you know, for me, I feel like it's for them, it's just one, one or the other side. You're either on one side or the other side. So there's no room for a uh, critical perspective on both sides of the Cold War. And that carries over into the politics of today. And that's where Rock Hill is today. You know, he's definitely interested in taking sides in geopolitical competition, as are, you know, Ahaz and uh, Carlos Garrido from uh, Midwestern Marx. You know, um, they're, they're for the axis of resistance, so Russia, Iran, China. And even to the point of saying that Iran is socialist, which of course it isn't at all. <laughs> so not even in any conceivable way. Um, and you know they killed all the socialists there. So um, you know in in you know not not in some like arcane way of like well China's not socialist. I mean Russia is obviously not socialist today. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is uh, where it's coming from. And I was just looking at. You know, the, the other figure that um, you didn't mention is, of course, someone who's passed on, Domenico Lacerdo. Right. Who's right. a really important sort of reference point for these guys. And I was reading his Western Marxism book in preparation for this today. Okay. And it's just a screed. It's just a screed like his liberalism book and his Nietzsche book. These are just screeds. And, um, you know, chock full of like facts, you know, like damning facts, kind of gossip. And um, but really just attacking people for supposed political positions that they had, you know, as if Nietzsche had political positions, he kind of didn't kind of the most apolitical person you can imagine. Um, but, you know, that's the technique. Right. Um, and so it's just some kind of, you know, well, what side of Vietnam were Horkheimer and Adorno and Habermas and Marcuse on this kind of thing? And so it's the which it's side the kind of thing were that, they on? Well, they're on neither side. Okay. I mean, here's a catchphrase. Adorno said, "Of course, we're against all um, colonialist and imperialist wars." But you know, the Vietnamese practice Chinese methods of torture, so that's not great. So uh, Lesordo calls this equivocation, and uh, he goes after Marcuse on Israel. Where Marcuse is like, well, of course, I, I'm very opposed to Zionism. But if you look at uh, the Arab animus towards Israel, it's not good. Right? So that's equivocation. No, it's both sides are bad. 
is that hard from a socialist perspective? Is that hard? But actually, Lacerdo says, no, that's not the primary contradiction. The primary contradiction is not socialism and capitalism. It's colonialism and anti-colonialism. It's imperialism and anti-imperialism. And that's what it's all about. So this isn't Marxism at all, as far as I'm concerned. Like Rock Hill, this is not Marxism whatsoever. I'll stake my claim on, on that point. Did it? They have no interest in the Frankfurt School's Marxism because they're not Marxist. Okay. Okay, that's good. That's a good start. So wouldn't, um, and eventually I hope that, you know, you've already said you're down uh, to have a conversation with with Rock Hill. But right now, speak of sure. the devil, he is currently busy uh, finalizing a project on publishing an English translation of something by Lazardo. And so that's mm -hmm. that's why he's busy right now. Uh, but he mm -hmm. said we'll definitely catch up soon or whatever. And so, you know, until then, we're just going to, you know, uh, develop our understanding of of your take on the situation, right? And so I have a few questions to follow up on that, but I am curious just, you know, Mikey is as if not more outside of a lot of this discourse than I am. And so I'm just curious if you have any sort of off the top of your head, kind of maybe even duh kind of questions, uh, Mikey. Yeah, I, I guess, Chris, you know, because there was a lot of talk, you know, okay, so Tuck Philosophy or Giannis Cheka uh, wrote a book on Marxism and Nietzsche. Daniel Tuck wrote a book on Marxism and Nietzsche. This is kind of in the the theory air, so to speak. And yeah, a lot of it, I think, starts with, is it Lacerdo? Is that his name? Yeah. 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 I, um, I guess my thing is, yeah, I mean, I guess, I because I, I, I don't know if I've ever heard you talk about it. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there any reason for a Marxist to try to incorporate Nietzsche into Marxism? Or are we kind of, it, we kind of doing like a, a kind of philosophical stretch to even make Nietzsche, like you were kind of alluding to, like a, like a serious systematic political thinker? I mean, like Deleuze tried to make him a serious, systematic metaphysician. Uh, right. You could argue that's more Deleuze than mm -hmm. Nietzsche himself. But yeah, I guess I'm curious about how you as a Marxist think about Nietzsche, uh, whether or not he's a systematic thinker or not, and whether or not Marxism needs some sort of Nietzschean supplement at all. Right. So, um, you know, it's it's very parallel to the question of like Freud and Marx, like Freudo Marxism, like that kind of whole conception, um, because I don't think that the a good way of understanding it is like a Freudian supplement of Marx. Uh, it's rather what do Marxists think of Freud, and also of the truth of Freud, right? And so, in in both cases with Freud and Nietzsche, they're symptoms, meaning a Marxist approach would take the truths that they articulate and resituate them in a more historically specific way. Meaning, um, you know, both Freud and Nietzsche were aware of their own times and Nietzsche is very much aware of his own time, but he situates his own time historically differently than Marxism would. Right. And that, and actually that's part of like the late Lukács and the destruction of reason. Lasordo, right, they tie Nietzsche to the epoch of imperialism, you know, to the late 19th century kind of second industrial revolution moment, you know, a kind of late colonial moment, like scramble for Africa moment, but really German unification moment, Franco-Prussian war, right, this kind of thing. Um, so, you know, the Prussian Empire. Now, starting there, we could just say, Nietzsche is horrified by the Franco-Prussian War and by the German victory and by the German triumphalism. And really, he's very critical of like German nationalism per se. And, uh, you know, he's proud to consider himself a mongrel. He's proud of his Polish heritage. He's very critical of the anti-Semitism that isn't just traditional anti-Semitism, but a kind of modern anti-Semitism of his time that you see in Germany uh, around German nationalism. Um, and uh, but he's also critical of the socialist movement. 
throughout the 19th century, but also specifically in his time. And he's not really aware of Marx. He is aware of uh, LaSalle. And he's aware of the anarchists. He's very much aware of Proudhon and Bakunin. But, you know, Marx and Engels are not really that important at that time. So we don't have any, like, dialogue between Nietzsche and, and Marx or Marxism. So, okay, so that much I would agree with the critics of Nietzsche on, that he is a creature of his time. But again, he's not, even though he was taken up, you know, by his sister, first of all, and later by the Nazis, he was taken up in really contrary to the spirit of his own work. He's taken up to be some kind of advocate of German nationalism and later even of Nazism. And Nietzsche, we have to remember, by the way, all, also Hegel are blamed not only for Nazism, they are, which seems like a big stretch with the case of Hegel, but uh, German militarism in World War I. Right. So the um, the British, the French, the Americans, they're like, yeah, these Germans. They've got these philosophers, they've got Hegel, they've got Nietzsche. They're nationalist, militarist people, the Germans. And look at their philosophers. Now, I don't think so. So I think um, Nietzsche in his own time is more of a distressed liberal. Again, from a Stalinist perspective, distressed liberalism can also be, you know, colonialist, imperialist, etc. It can, of course. But... I see him as a critic, Nietzsche, of liberalism and of socialism and of the affinities of the two. And primarily, though, he's a critic of Christianity and how he sees Christianity playing out in liberalism and socialism. That's where the parallels with the Marxist critique of socialism would come in, meaning Marx also has a critique of the socialists of his time and of the prevailing ideology of socialism, and of the mentality of socialism, and of the general orientation of socialism, Marx has right. this critique. And there are important parallels there between Marx and Nietzsche. But again, Nietzsche is not, you know, he's giving us this bizarre last man over man kind of prognosis on the future. And he's kind of predicting like a catastrophic 20th century that he wants to see as some kind of massive emancipation potentially even though it might be the exact opposite of that and so you know it's a little uncanny we might say like is is he predicting socialist revolution and is he calling that the last man and is the revolution the overman that he's calling for is that like fascism right this is the dominant interpretation i don't think it's correct and I don't think you need to be a Marxist to know that it's not correct. So I'm like a kind of a Walter Kaufman reader of Nietzsche. I'll just say that. Um, you know, I find Kaufman's interpretation of Nietzsche very compelling. And his paralleling of Nietzsche and Hegel, I find that very compelling. And also I'm a student of Robert Pippin. So I will say also Pippin brings out the liberal and the dialectical character of Nietzsche. In a way, you know, it's a kind of Hegelian appropriation of Nietzsche. So the real issue is, what would a Marxist appropriation of Nietzsche amount to? It would be very similar to Freud in the sense that it's it's descriptive. Meaning, Freud does describe the psychology of capitalism um, at a certain stage, right? And then there's the question of what comes in the 20th century. And... Nietzsche also, in a very different way, because it's philosophical, it's not clinical and psychological, although Nietzsche called himself a psychologist. And Freud even said that he had read Nietzsche, but then he hadn't read him in a long time. And then he was embarrassed to learn, going back to Nietzsche, how many parallels there were between his thought and Nietzsche's thought. Right. Um, but I do think it comes from someplace else. I don't think that Freud was just an unconscious Nietzschean. I think that he, I take his clinical interpretation seriously and his clinical theory seriously um but at a philosophical level now again heidegger is a kind of nietzschean max weber's a nietzschean 
but they're peculiar kind of Nietzscheans. Foucault is a Nietzschean. If you read his essay on Nietzsche, Nietzsche genealogy history, it's really fascinating. He's like, Nietzsche's right, except for the freedom part. So that gets me to maybe my other point, which is that I consider Nietzsche a philosopher of freedom. And I do think freedom is the missing piece with respect to the left and socialism. I think that freedom drops out, especially in the Cold War context. And up till now, freedom is seen as kind of bourgeois ideology. Um, because again, it's some kind of weird, like, we're going to take how the U.S. projected itself in the Cold War as the, you know, upholder of freedom. And we're going to say, and that's what's wrong with it. And I'm like, no, no, you can't. <laughs> you can't. I mean, I want to touch on what you guys were talking about earlier, Dave, with um, with Tony and Eamon on the American Revolution, too. Well, but we'll come uh back to that. Yeah, I'd like to come back to the American we'll Revolution and uh, the CIA and the, the 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 Center for Cultural Freedom and and all of those kind of things in a second. But uh, and I also really want to touch on the anti-imperialism is not Marxism take because uh, I feel like these are all very important threads. But I kind of want to. I'll say one more thing about Nietzsche, which is supposed. I have a okay, I ahead. have a Nietzsche quote that maybe oh, you good. could tie into what you want to okay. say. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want you to judge a book by how I use a quote, you know, I would like you to read the afterword at minimum to my time energy book. Uh, I'll send it to you if you don't have a copy, but I'll, I just want, I, I do want you to talk about this quote, but how I use this quote, I just kind of want everyone to keep in mind. I'm not going to sit mm -hmm. here and explain to you all how and why I use it, but I'd like to say, I feel like I'm going beyond Lazardo, potentially Tut. I, I'm trying to do something different here. But mm -hmm. a quote I find very powerful is that he says, if the need for and the refinement of a superior culture penetrates the working class, it can no longer do the work without suffering disproportionately. I, I, for that, a worker thus developed aspires to otium, leisure time, and does not ask for a lightening of labor, but for liberation from it, i.e. to impose its burden on another. Now, Two things, because I'm about to read the rest of the quote. The, to impose its burden on another is to say, uh, well, the, the working class has its burden, but it can impose that on someone else. And so let's let's turn to wh who else? He says, um, let's find the, the rest of the quote. Uh, one could perhaps, let's see. If the need for the refinement of superior culture penetrates where he's no longer do the work without suffering just by work. Okay, well, here's the rest of the quote. One could perhaps think of satisfying his desires and massively introducing barbaric Asian and African populations so that the civilized world continues to use the services of the uncivilized world and thus non-culture would be considered precisely to be a sort of corvée. So he and and this is all in the context of him being concerned with the leveling effects that are making workers desire something more than just their work. But he's not advocating this, is he? He's basically saying this could happen. Well, he when he went to fight the levelers, right? He actually enlisted when he didn't have to to go fight the levelers, and he was with the most, according to Lazardo, I don't know, but like a, the most reactionary. There were no levelers in Nietzsche's lifetime. The faction. levelers are from the 17th century. Okay. Well, Zero likes doing this shit, though. Do you he know? Calls the 20th century the Napoleonic Wars. Do you know, like what, like what, what war he went and fought in, or whatever, like off the top of your head? Franco-Prussian War. Okay, and so that was not because he's, he, he never wasn't... saw any fighting, and he got sick and got cashed out, and then he complained that maybe the commune, the fighting around the commune, might end up destroying priceless works of art, and people are like, "Oh, he only cares about works of art. We should care about works of art." Actually, sure. yeah, we, we definitely hot take. Should. Hot take. I mean, Chris, yeah. Chris, like this is what we're we always are kind of dealing with when Nietzsche comes up is that there's certain people on the left who are who are, are basically saying, "Look, Nietzsche was an aristocrat and <laughs> he defended aristocracy. It's not like like I like this idea maybe of a universal aristocracy. The idea that everybody." has more time energy everybody has more leisure like you know you know we're about time energy but mm -hmm. nietzsche is presented by certain marxists as uh 
like, okay, we're the noble aristocrats. We're the creative ones. We need the peasants over there to do the work. We don't want them getting culture. We don't want them having odium so we can do our thing. And I, there's other, like I say, there's other readings of Nietzsche where Nietzsche is much more a champion of individual freedom and individual cultivation of one's self-creativity. And there's points in Nietzsche where I'm like, I don't, I, I get a universal thing from him where he's, he's not just saying, you know, oh, the vast majority of people have to do shitty work and never engage in self-becoming, self-creation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I see this other aspect of Nietzsche that's much more of like a universal existentialist type, champion of individual freedom. And so, I don't know, but this comes back to my question. Is it just that he's not as systematic as, say, like a uh -oh. philosopher on the level of Kant uh -oh. or, you know? Right. Okay, so maybe that brings us around to it because, um, you know, there's the whole kind of bourgeois meritocracy, natural aristocracy idea. Right. And, you know, we know it from liberalism, like equality of opportunity, not of outcomes. Right. And, you know, so this is what I mean when I say Nietzsche is a liberal, meaning, you know, he's like, yeah, maybe some people are not interested in uh, doing philosophy and art. Maybe some people get their satisfaction out of repetitive labor. You know, um, now, so what's the point of all that? Because he's not painting a political picture. He's not giving a political vision. He's talking about a crisis, what he called the crisis of European civilization. And really the crisis of Christianity and its bourgeois aftermath. And, you know, and capitalism, of course, right? So he does see capitalism as a kind of playing out of... Um, a kind of bourgeois humanism and a kind of Christianity, um, you know, a kind of a slave morality um, that is, you know, falsely preached to the subaltern, right? So the priests, you know, so it's kind of like there are two targets of the slave morality. There's the aristocracy and there's the common people. and Nietzsche thinks that when the aristocracy gets slave morality, when the aristocracy gets Christianity, it's good because it's a self-overcoming, it's a, from a position of strength. Whereas if the subaltern embrace Christianity, it's, it's inauthentic because it's actually not a self-overcoming. It's a kind of rationalization of one's condition. And it's resentment, right? So, I mean, is there something systematic in Nietzsche? I mean, so Nietzsche was taken up by the postmodernists as a kind of anti-metaphysical thinker. And here I'll just use a, a phrase of Robert Pippin. I don't think um, Kant or Hegel or Nietzsche or Marx are anti-metaphysical. I think they're post-metaphysical, which is different, meaning they have a different understanding of metaphysics, the non-traditional philosophical understanding of what metaphysics is really about. And for Nietzsche, metaphysics is, you know, psychological. It's like a kind of, or a kind of will to power that's like inherent in biological life itself, you know? And, um, you know, which is a very peculiar way of putting it. Um, Kant and Hegel and Marx have a more kind of social historical understanding of the origin of metaphysics. And there is a crisis of European metaphysics in, in the 19th century, in, in this time, in Nietzsche's time. And that's where he's getting his, you know, last man over man idea. He's like, this form of life is in crisis. It's landing in nihilism. And that's not a bad thing. It's actually, you know, a, something that tasks humanity, right? European humanity, right? Because, you know, I think it would be arguable whether the entire world had landed in this metaphysical nihilism at the end of the 19th century. Maybe in 2024, the whole world has. But in Nietzsche's time, maybe not yet. Right? I mean, the quote, the quotation, Dave, that you read sounds to me like a total setup in the sense of sounds like Nietzsche is arguing for the labor aristocracy in imperialism. 
you know, that the Western workers should have their workload lightened, but it should be fobbed off on the workers of the third world or something, you know, that the American working class has its standard of living boosted by the, you know, real like slave-like exploitation of people in the colonial or post-colonial or neo-colonial world. That's what that sounds like. It sounds like, oh, yeah, Nietzsche's seeing that and he is advocating it. And I just feel like, well, that would still like not really get at what Nietzsche's concern actually is, which is, um, and this is what Heidegger picks up on, by the way, from Nietzsche, which is that this Western metaphysics that's traceable all the way back to classical antiquity has been leading us to this place, right? Has been leading us to a kind of labor metaphysics and a kind of nihilistic dead end. And, you know, historically, of course, that's not true. That's not even true for most of the bourgeois epoch. It's it's very true of the industrial capitalist epoch. And again, that's where Marxism would say, you know, Nietzsche is describing something real. But he's misattributing it and he's putting it in the wrong historical frame. It's like Western civilization rather than like industrial capitalism. And so it would it would require a reinterpretation of what Nietzsche is talking about at a more fundamental level than just saying, oh, what does he say about the workers? I guess the the last thing on that is I I did find the quote. So, um, and this, I don't want to put this conversation away um, because I, 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 it's one we're going to keep coming back to. In fact, what's interesting just to observe is that he does think the condition, Nietzsche thought that the condition of the workers is exemplary of the modern era per se. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He did think that. Uh, your friend Spencer Leonard, who had a conversation with Matt McManus on this channel about this very topic, is actually working on a piece that's going to address Lazardo a bit more um, in depth, I think, and actually for TUCon. But but really quick, the quote though, he says that uh, when the War of 1870 exploded, the brilliant professor of classical philology momentarily abandoned university teaching in the neutral Swiss city of. Basil, Basel, to enlist as a volunteer in the Prussian army, he brought with him the hopes and myths of his time, which were also the center of the birth of tragedy, right? So at the time that he wrote The Birth of Tragedy, this is when he goes and does this. And it's in The Birth of Tragedy that he talks about uh, the slaves rising up against the slave owners in the American Civil War, as well as other instances, I don't, I don't really know about all the, I, I can't really, I, I'm not a historian. No, he doesn't I can't. talk about that in the birth of tragedy. He doesn't talk about the U S civil war now. That seemed to be what I, I, I thought Lizardo was saying. Every year. No, this is what Lizardo does. Like I said, he thinks that the cold war is the Napoleonic wars. He literally uses it as a trope. He's like, yeah, the Napoleonic wars, meaning the U S fighting the Soviet Union. Like what the fuck? Okay. And the levelers, right? Like Nietzsche's, going up against the levelers. He's volunteering to fight the levelers. No, there are no levelers. There's the Paris Commune, but he's not going to fight the Paris Commune. He's going to fight Louis Bonaparte, who instigated the war. Come on. Right? I'm not going to stand and defend Nietzsche signing up for the Prussian military. I can only say that later in life, he said that uh, Prussianism is only good for one thing, goose stepping. And he meant that negatively. Okay. Right? So come on, you know, yeah. and the birth of tragedy, I mean, look, the birth of tragedy is the early Nietzsche is the young Nietzsche. It's overwrought. He criticized it himself later in life. He's like, so, I'm not sure what the hell I was talking about. Like he writes a preface, like an attempted self-criticism. He's like, what could I possibly have been thinking when he wrote this book? And he means it quite literally. And, um, you know, but it, it's about again, Western metaphysics and Socrates and truth, right? That's that's what the young Nietzsche is all about. It's about art, philosophy, and science. And how science has defeated both philosophy and art. And how science defeated art with the help of philosophy. But there should be a philosophy that is not just science. Mm -hmm. And he's basically saying art. We need art. We need a Socrates who can play music. Right. right? No, absolutely. Uh, 
right? That's what it's about. It's about art. It's about tragedy. It's not about the U.S. Civil War. Give me a break. Well, okay. And so I, I, I guess I'd have to look at it a little bit more. But for the time being, I, think that's, I think that's good enough. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, you know? so I... But Lacerda was just doing a hack job. I mean, look, I, he's just a Stalinist <laughs> prosecutor. That's what he's doing. He's Kamala I, Harris on steroids. I just, I because of the conversation I had with... Because of what I said, <laughs> because of the fact that I hosted that conversation between uh, Leonard and McManus, uh, and of course I am uh, in the same way that I just was with you, pulling up quotes and very curious, you know. Um, I think people took this idea, oh, I just am, I'm, I'm just taking the McManus tut position on this. And it's like, no, actually, my position is instead of taking the Walter Kaufman position, as you do, I say, yeah, no. I take the Lizardo position. I just accept it. And then I say, so what? He's right. <laughs> we don't want to lose our aristocratic culture, the higher arts, the finer things. We actually do need that. Uh, any kind of revolutionary project that throws that out is missing the point. And therefore, that's how a Marxist informed or any kind of large scale structural change the movement said needs him. You know, Lizardo and Rock Hill, of course, hate Trotsky, but I'll just quote Trotsky from Literature and Revolution. You know, from the early Soviet era, he said, in socialism, the average person is going to be a Goethe or a Marx or a Mozart. You know, and that's the vision. Like, you want to know, like, there is a utopianism to Marxism. Yeah. That's the vision. Yeah. Well, and that would be, I think, another, I mean, maybe if Jonas Cheka wants to do a sequel, that's where he could go with it. But he would actually have to engage with 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 this whole line of argumentation and from what i can tell he's avoided which is it. true to marx by the way marx in the german ideology he's like you know yeah everyone will like you know work a couple of hours do some hobbies right. philosophize right. criticize right right um it's a it's a it's a bourgeois humanist vision right absolutely we're we're, we're, down, with very that. we're down with that you know, like classical, you know, it's like we want everyone to have what the oligarchical citizens of ancient Athens had. Right. So, OK, like and and what? Right. And and I mean, look, again, you don't use Nietzsche to help get you to socialism, but Nietzsche is compelling in terms of describing the subjectivity and the metaphysical presuppositions of capitalism. And in its crisis, right, the kind of nihilistic dead end, but again, not in the way that I think the left has a very non-dialectical view of capitalism. They're just like, oh, capitalism is life destroying. It's nihilistic. It's just bad. It's like, yeah, but we got to use it to get to socialism. We got to we got to accept the task of capitalism, meaning capitalism has made us what we are, and we have to transform the world on that basis. All what right, we are so, now. So that's that's a point well taken. Now, while we're still on this segment, I, I feel like there were all those other questions that we wanted to get to. And I feel like the most important one, probably, it's the one that everyone who's trying to think about this critically, at least, is going to want to come back to. And that's just the question of anti-imperialism. And I guess I'll set you up by just saying, well, isn't Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, according to Lenin, wouldn't you at least agree with Rock Hill on that? How is anti-imperialism not the next thing? And how would you separate colonialism and imperialism from capitalism if for your for your Marxism? All right. So I would just say, um, you know, and yeah, my friend and, and collaborator Spencer Leonard has published two books of Marx's writings, Marx and Engels' writings on imperialism and Bonapartism. One book on imperialism, the other book on Bonapartism. They mean the same thing. Okay. That's what imperialism means. It means the second empire. It means Louis Bonaparte. And it means the British Empire, Disraeli. Um, it means uh, the German Empire, of course, Bismarck. Right? So uh, that's what it means. And Germany didn't really have any colonies to speak of. I mean, they got some colonies but they weren't like the British and the French in terms of colonial empires. And nonetheless, they were imperialist. What does that mean? They had an imperial state. So the British and the French and the 
colonialism, the late colonialism of the capitalist era was a projection of that capitalist state, of that imperial state, of that Bonapartist state. And you had the most extreme expression of Bonapartism in the colonies. You know, what Later, you know, like Aimé Césaire said, you know, fascism was just bringing what was going on in the colonies back to the metropole. That's true. That is true. Depends on what you conclude from that, right? So um, now in terms of the highest stage of capitalism, well, it's 2024. And Lenin wrote that in 1916. I don't think we've had a higher stage of capitalism after imperialism. But I do think that maybe we're not at the highest stage of capitalism now, meaning for Lenin writing it when he did. Hello, beautiful listener. I I see you. Just kidding. I don't, I, I can't. But I have to interrupt this just really quick to make my own advertisement, my very own. The one that says subscribing, liking, commenting, it actually makes a really big difference. So even if you're just on the free side, shout out to you. Thanks for doing it. Make sure to subscribe and all that, especially people on the podcast. Make sure to say something nice in the reviews. It actually really helps. And uh, I need reviews on every platform, all right, because it, it, it I, I just hate to say it. It matters, you know. I try not to chase the almighty algorithm, but also I don't want to have all of this beautiful content go to waste. And so I'm trying to walk a fine line between quality and quantity. And I come out way heavier on the side of quality, as you can obviously see we do here. But come on, let's uh, let's let's push that subscribe button, you know, let's smash that like button, you know, like uh, teach the algorithm what you actually care about. All right. And then maybe it'll show it to other people. That's great. All right. Let's get back to it. I do think that maybe we're not at the highest stage of capitalism now, meaning for Lenin writing it when he did. He thought highest stage of capitalism means prelude to socialism. That's what he thought that meant. And we're not we're not there. We're not there's no prelude to socialism right now. No. And so um you know he was dealing with anti-imperialism, Lenin. He was critiquing anti-imperialism. Why? Because anti-imperialism was conservative reactionary. It was Hobson. There was liberal anti-imperialism. There was the Anti-Imperialist League in the United States. There was William Jennings Bryan, who is a conservative. That's why he joined the Democratic Party, because the Democrats were the conservatives. Anti-imperialism was anti-monopoly capitalism, anti-finance capitalism against the big industrial robber barons. That sounds good, doesn't it? Except no, they wanted to turn the historical clock back on that and you can't right they wanted to restore petty bourgeois local small town capitalism they wanted to restore bourgeois society but the only way you could conceivably do that is small town capitalism i mean you can't undo the industrial revolution so most anti-imperialism is right wing the nazis were anti-imperialist so Okay. Did you say the Nazis were anti-imperialists? Yes, absolutely. Of course they were. Their condemnation of the British and the French was that they were imperialist. And they saw Germany as being a victim of their imperialism. Yeah, but Hitler they thought and... They were, tried, they were going to be colonized. They were like, look at what the French and the British do to the Africans. They want to do it to us. Wasn't that like the Russian and German positions more or less over time. It was like, we're anti-imperialist. We have to go to war and we have to become the new empire. Otherwise we'll, it was an imperialism ultimatum. You could say so. I mean, again, anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism really doesn't get you very far, meaning on what basis and what's the outcome of the anti-colonial or anti-imperial struggle supposed to be? Is it supposed to be? Like capitalist nationalism, is that the upshot? And that's supposed to see, be seen as progressive in some way? Progressive how? Right? So, again, I would say Marxism is not anti capitalist. It's not anti imperialist. It's not anti capitalist. It's not anti capitalist. There's a lot of anti capitalism. See it in religion. 
you know, Michael Moore's Capitalism, a Love Story, written, I mean, uh, conceived and filmed after the financial crisis. And uh, he goes to a rabbi, a Protestant minister, a Catholic priest, a Muslim imam, a Buddhist monk, a Jewish rabbi. And he says, what do you think of capitalism? And they all say, it's evil. They all say it's evil, including the Protestant minister, which is a shocker for Michael Moore. But of course, from that standpoint, from the standpoint of any religious or traditional value system, even a bourgeois Christianity like Protestantism, from any such perspective, capitalism is evil. That's not Marxism. That's just not Marxism. That's not the approach to capitalism that Marxism has. And imperialism, late colonialism, the imperial state, Bonapartism, it's not just like a bad thing that one is against. The issue is, what does it represent historically and has a point beyond itself? And how are we going to overcome it and not imagine that we're turning the clock back on it? Yeah, the Nazis were anti-finance capital. Right. They called it the Jews. Right. And by that the way, that's where it all goes. That's where it all goes, by the way. It always goes to anti-Semitism. It always does. Well, there's people who would say that any anti-capitalism is ultimately just a sort of that there's there's people who will say any critique of power is really just anti-Semitic logic hiding itself or whatever. You know, that's a very popular thing among progressives today. It's a it's a it's really annoying, actually. But depends on what the power is. Right. So but anti-capitalism and anti-imperialism. So, you know, my old professor, Moish Pastone, he said um, he quoted August Babel, who was uh, the chairman, you know, the, the organizational leader of the German SPD that anti-Semitism is the socialism of fools. It's the socialism of fools, but it's the socialism of fools. So Moish Pistone said anti-Zionism is the anti-imperialism of fools. It's the anti-imperialism of fools, meaning Israel doesn't control the world, newsflash, but it's the anti-imperialism of fools, right? Meaning there's a misrecognition there that has a kind of a kind of a logic to it, but is a misrecognition. And you know everything's a kind of a misrecognition, but there are better and worse misrecognitions, right? Uh, you know Hobson, who I mentioned, also an anti-Semite, and he was a liberal. You don't have to be a Nazi to be an anti-Semite. Not at all. Right, right. So again, what? how do we think of the problem of capitalism? But more importantly, how do we imagine we're going to overcome it? So that's really the issue. Right. And, you know, so it's not to say, look, the U.S., I mean, to come around to the American Revolution bit, the U.S. is very different under capitalism than it was when it made the revolution and when they wrote the Constitution. It's just a totally different world. So we have to take it from the horse's mouth. Woodrow Wilson, the president of U.S. imperialism in World War I, said the Constitution isn't applicable anymore. We have to pay it lip service because it's the Constitution, but in practice we violate it all the time. And we set up a fourth branch of government because that's what we need. He admired Bismarckian Germany as a model, as did a lot of progressives. He's like, yeah, we need that here. So, of course, socialists were always against that, but that's a that's a violation of the American Revolution. It's a violation. It's an explicit violation of the U.S. Constitution. We are living the last hundred and more years under the explicit violation of the U.S. Constitution by the dominant political parties. Now, the Republicans, of course, get to pretend that they defend the Constitution, but they don't. Right? Now, we're not going to turn the clock back. We're not. We're not going to restore the U.S. Constitution. However, uh, we might want to uphold the rights, the Bill of Rights, the rights in the Constitution. We might want to make the capitalist politicians 
stick to the constitution even though we know that they can't stick to it and they don't want to but we might we might use that we might use the constitution against them in a way that they can't really defend the constitution and not just as like a, a rhetorical ploy but because of the principles that the constitution upholds which have to be violated in capitalism i mean i'll just you know i brought up freud earlier I teach civilization as discontents all the time. And, you know, in two classes every year, um, two different classes, one to social workers, the other to my art students. And he says, you know, when you have a revolution, you have a revolution when the ruling class is seen by the people as betraying the values that they're supposed to uphold. That's when you have a revolution. You don't have a revolution because some radical intellectuals come up with a new value system and try to preach it to the people they'll never accept it you have a revolution when the ruling class when the state violates the values it proclaims that's so you got to organize that you have to organize that that's the only way you're going to have massive political transformation in the united states aka revolution the people are never going to make a revolution in the United States by being anti-American. That's never going to happen. That's no, insane. All the immigrants coming in, they're going to be the fiercest defenders of America, right? Like some rich wasp people can afford to be anti-American. Right. The rest of us, no. No, it's a luxury belief. It's a total luxury belief. Total. Yeah. Anti-Americanism is radical chic. They already mm -hmm. talked about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it reminds me of the, Albert Camus once said, you know, defending the idea of people wanting to have money. He's like, yeah, it's very privileged if you can sit there and go, oh, people who care about money so much are, you know. Grubby, grubby materialists. It's like, yeah, it's easy exactly. for you to say. Yeah. <laughs> You know? It's always these. It's but, always these rich kid millionaires who are like going, like, oh yeah, uh, you just not work. <laughs> money isn't everything. Money yeah. isn't everything. Money's not everything. It's like, well, <laughs> <laughs> you got to survive first. Kind of is when you don't have it. <laughs> yeah, it, um, it's you know. So, but you know, but we're not talking about money. The American dream is not money. It's freedom. Yeah. 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 Dave, and I oh, 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 hold on. Let me just interject real quick. So I have one question. For Chris, but I, and I was going to save it for the next segment, but I almost think it kind of ties in here to this, this question of imperialism being the highest stage of capitalism. Um, and so, Chris, it's kind of a cluster of questions, but I just think it's better here in this segment. Okay. Um, so, I had uh, first time getting to talk to you, I was like, okay, I've got to ask Chris one. How familiar are you with the work of Nick Land? Not hardly at all. Okay. So By reputation yeah. only. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, um, I might have read a couple of things, but no. Okay. So in the 90s, he's kind of a kind of renegade, rebellious philosopher at Warwick University. Um, he leads the CCRU Cybernetic Culture Research Unit. Um, they turn philosophy conferences into these giant parties, these raves. They've got electronic music blaring. They're, people are dancing, doing drugs. Um, it, 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 they, they were trying to find a way to make philosophy exciting, to try mm -hmm. to make philosophy um, almost into a subculture. And so there's ways that I draw a lot of inspiration from them in that regard. But you know, Land famously ends up becoming one of the, the leaders of neo-reactionary thought. Him and Curtis Yarvin are Mensis Mulbug. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but one thing throughout Land's work, um, at least like from the mid '90s on up, um, like Land's central thesis is capitalism is artificial intelligence. And what he means by that is that the very mode of production, the very the, the very mechanism of capital accumulation, actually in its very structure, necessarily produces artificial intelligence. And for him, at least at one point, he's talking super intelligence, you know, mm -hmm. godlike. And so for him, capital is like MC and prime would be the larval seed 
of the what he calls the techno capital singularity. And so the question is like one, what do you think about like what capitalism at the moment is doing with AI? And do you see it like if it, let's do like a hypothetical if capitalism gives rise to super intelligence it, it, i mean is there any way to even think like we human beings survive that they live through that um because for for land basically the 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 emergence of super intelligence is the culmination of capitalism and in some way shape or form it's going to bring about human extinction and so capital like like capital is like the death core of humanity it, it's going to wipe us all out um and so i guess you know and look trying to say like why does he think it necessarily gives rise to it i mean that's kind of like hegel thinks we arrive at absolute knowledge it's like you kind of got to work through the argument but mm -hmm. it's still like i just i would love to get your initial impressions of that central thesis capitalism is artificial intelligence and if we see an AI explosion. Um, what is that? It, it, would would we would, would consider that a higher stage of capital? All right. So he's associated with accelerationism, and I'll use that kind of idea as my jumping off point. So I don't think the capitalism is super intelligence. I think it's super anti intelligence, meaning it's um, a kind of a black hole. It's a kind of a void. It's not a singularity. It's singularity in the sense of a black hole. It's not singularity. But first of all, I don't think there is artificial intelligence. I also don't think there will be artificial intelligence. I think that what you'll have is super fast machine learning. You'll have basically automation. Right? And that's what we have. That is not intelligence. So he's conflating two things. He's conflating. I always like to bring this up, how everybody conflates bourgeois society and capitalism. And for Marx and for Marxism, capitalism contradicts bourgeois society. So bourgeois society, you could say society is the superintelligence and that we've always had it since the human revolution, since the hunter gatherers, since the invention of culture, religion, etc. cetera. Um, society is more intelligent than its members. Society is the superintelligence. Um, now, capitalism is the virus in the superintelligence. That's unwinding it, meaning you could say that bourgeois society is the highest form of culture, community, civilization at the level of a Rousseauian general will. But capitalism is the undoing of that, meaning capitalism is the negation of that. Like MCM prime on a runaway train is the negation of that. Right. So it's the it's the super anti intelligence. It's not the super intelligence. Right? It's the threat to the superintelligence, I would say. And we have to overcome it because what it is, is it's a destructive tendency in logic that can't actually eliminate its substratum. But it can make its substratum, namely us as social beings, suffer a great deal. And I don't think we're ever going to reach the end of that suffering. Meaning, you know, the way I see it now, if I had to say, where is the world going? Space fascism. That's where it's going. It's not going to the extinction of the human race. That's too optimistic. It's going to space space capitalism. Even space fascism might be... Chris, I, just, I, I do have to add, when, uh -huh. I, when we were interviewing Slavoj Žižek, he said, the ex he goes, this vision of land is way too optimistic. It's way because too optimistic. It gives you too, such a clear-cut final key loss like oh this is just it's like oh if only we it was that clear right it's everything everywhere all at once if you saw that movie it's the everything donut or the everything bagel everything bagel that's like the you know um the rebus right that the millennial chick is gonna destroy the world in her nihilism and the gen x chick who is her mother michelle Yu, is like please don't destroy the world like that's like me i talk i tell the millennials please please don't do that um and then the boomer guy like the most famous asian american actor of all time is like yeah you know i'm old 
right? So like basically it's like a perfect movie to capture our moment. Um, you know, and if not the millennials, the zoomers are gonna eat the uh the everything bagel and you know destroy all space time. You know? J Reg will be the one that eats it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but please don't, children, please don't. You know, <laughs> Dave. You're muted, Dave. No, no wonder I couldn't interject. Okay, yeah, uh, right. I want, <laughs> I want you to write a piece now for the Human Futures volume. You can keep it very short to 500 words, called "Space Fascism and the Everything Bagel." Don't eat it, kids, or something like that, man. <laughs> that would be because I, I love that analysis of that movie. That movie yes, really that does needs to exist. That needs that to needs exist. To exist. <laughs> um, but I was going to. Uh, I wanted to. I I I think that uh, M A five twelve in the chat is correct when he said that you will need to define intelligence, or you're just pack, pack, uh, talking past the accelerationists. Just, but, I mean, land in this case. But for me, right? Uh, I think and uh, Nance, Mikey, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the way we're thinking about intelligence here is depersonified and self correcting. Yeah, That's, right. Because what I mean, look, he's going to base it in the losing Guattari, right? And remember, and, at the time that he's working this stuff out. He's like one of the world-renowned the Luzo Guattarian scholars. Um, but 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 Mises as well, and the price system. Who, the yeah, price yeah, yeah. system is well, genius. It is intelligence because it's depersonified. It's self-correcting. It's outside of and beyond us. It, it's smarter than us. That's the point. Deleuze desire so, machines plus Mises. That's where you get this idea of intelligence. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, right. But it's also, yeah, it is impersonal. Um, and so by intelligence, land would almost mean the opposite of reason, right? The, mm -hmm. the opposite of human mm -hmm. thought. It's right. more the ability to self-refine your ability to do X with greater and greater efficiency, right? And so the idea is that Yes, of course, humans are going to program computers, they're going to write code, but as this process amplifies and intensifies, the coding will essentially cross a threshold. And this is, he's drawing on cybernetics, and yes, cybernetics talks about how we, you know, these processes do cross thresholds. He thinks that there's a, a certain breaking point where the code, uh, the, the computer code, will come to rewrite itself, decode itself, and recode itself. And the moment that it has the ability, to, the intelligence, right? Because in this sense, it, intelligence is more of a, an ability. The moment it has the ability to rewrite its own code, then it doesn't need us. And if, it, if this process is one that is, you know, based on its computing power, if it's, you know, instantaneous, it's, it's an explosion, well, then, I mean, basically, this is the moment that MCM Prime through its and, and it's not like it's do, it's the, the process right. of marketization and capital accumulation, building these machines to the point that it becomes self-reflective. And at that point, capital has, in Land's view, become Cthulhu, basically, like it's it, like that's why he draws so much on. Lovecraft is he thinks that the super intelligence will be just so and, and and he talks about thang noumena that and you know he's drawing on the Kantian sublime this thing is so far beyond us no this that, is too cheesy that's not what Kant meant by the sublime no it's way too cheesy um this is um you know like Cthulhu I mean Cthulhu is a human fantasy in the capitalist era you know, this kind of like neo-gnosticism, you know, it's a fantasy. It's it's our ideology. It's an ideological projection. It's not MCM prime because capital accumulation is something else. What we're what we're really talking about is a kind of Heideggerian, like the tool in framing us. Right. Yeah. yeah. Capital is not a tool. So in the in the. um Conventional view of things, like if you talk to like I don't know, capitalist economists. They think that they use capital for human ends. And then the question is, does capital dominate us? That's a Heideggerian view. That's not the Marx view. 
right? The Marx view is not like capital does, doesn't mean money. It doesn't mean like capital goods. It doesn't mean these technologies, these, you know, learn, uh, machine learning, computational forms. Um, it's not that, right? It's the negation of labor in bourgeois society. Now it ramifies, it has all these expressions, it has these manifestations. It has the manifestations of tools that come to serve a different end than what we in, intend to use them for. They tend to serve capital accumulation rather than human ends. But that doesn't mean that it's inherent in the tool. It's it's the social context in which that tool was developed and in which it's being used. So I do think we're going to need a qualitative transformation of technology beyond capitalism. I do think that we will need that. Like, it's not just about taking these tools and applying them to a different end. Right. I think that Heidegger or Nick Land, like they see the hopelessness of that. They're like, okay, you might try to take this technology and use it for different ends, but what you're going to find is that it's going to have the same ends because it has its own ends. Yeah, that's right? his, basically, in a nutshell, Land's critique of left accelerationism, which is to say, look, capital is in the process of, of technological development, et cetera, but we're trying to bend it in a way to liberate humanity. And land's just like, nope, that's, that's this is a mistake though, problem. because capitalism is not technologism. And it's not technologism in either a positive sense or a negative sense. Technology is not going to save us or destroy us. We are going to save ourselves or we are going to destroy ourselves. Right. So that's why I don't like the AI stuff. It's kind of like extraterrestrials, yeah. which is we have a fantasy that the extraterrestrials are either going to save us or destroy us. And it's like, or, you, well, or, you, or unite this. us against, or unite us against them, right? And then we get saved right. that way, yeah. And you know, so the first thing is, extraterrestrials don't exist, and that's why I say artificial intelligence doesn't exist, and they're not going to exist. We're not going to encounter artificial intelligence or extraterrestrials. Sorry to say, we're not. So, um, and we certainly can't hang on that, right? We for can't sure, wait on that, sure. right? But yeah, I also you, think it's a fantasy. Closer. What's that? Hmm? Oh wait, I I I, I wasn't sure. Are, are are we trying to? Are we moving on to the next? Or what are we doing? No, so we're about you know, we're about to kill before we. End. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, that's the yeah. thing. Is I was just like, well, I want to switch gears, but we have to finish out the Rock Hills. And so, closing okay. statement on that before we switch gears. All right. So, um, again, what I mentioned earlier about Lasordo saying that the Frankfurt School people are equivocal. Um, whereas I would say that they're trying under very bad conditions to maintain a dialectical view. So the, the text that I had something to do with publishing from the Frankfurt School that was hitherto unknown, at least in the English speaking world, but really outside the German world, was the Towards a New Manifesto, the Horkheimer and Adorno conversation around the Khrushchev condemnation of Stalin in 1956. So they were going to write a new communist manifesto for the 20th century. And they said they were going to write a strictly Leninist manifesto. Now, they talk about a lot of different things in that text. Um, but one thing vis-a-vis -vis the Cold War is important. So they say Russia's fascist. But the Soviet Union stands for a higher right than the West. The West is the greatest civilization that the world has ever produced in terms of human betterment, but to defend it would be the surest way to destroy it. Mm. Okay. Now, I was at the I, RNC, by I, the way, shooting a film at Milwaukee, and we talked to the Never Trumper Republicans, and they said um, the end of history was the end of America that winning the Cold War destroyed America. The Never Trumper Republicans, right? Huh. So, which I thought was an amazing insight. But again, no, that's not quite what's happened. Maybe we need to use it not to destroy America, but to revolutionize it and achieve socialism. Right, so again, that dialectical view of the Cold War 
in which the Cold War is understood on both sides as embodying a contradiction within each side, right? That, you know, Marxism gave rise to fascism. It did. The right is correct about that too. Mussolini was a Marxist and he invented fascism. Go figure, right? Uh, They called themselves the National Socialists, the Nazis. The National Socialist Workers' Party of Germany, the Nazis. The right is correct about that when they're like, fascism comes from the left. Of course it does. But one needs a dialectical view of these things. And by the way, when they said the Russians are fascists, the Soviet Union, they didn't think fascism was like the end. Like in the 30s, they didn't think that, the Frankfurt School. They didn't think it was the end. Right? They thought the struggle for socialism continues. It's not the end. So like there is this kind of 30s popular front Stalinist, like anti-fascism, anti-imperialism, where you need to be anti-colonial, anti-imperialist to the utmost, and you need to be anti-fascist to the utmost. And it's like, but wait a second, none of these things are a dead end. But that's the only way they can conceive of them because they're just anti. They don't they drop a dialectical view of these things. Even fascism. You can't just be an anti-fascist. You have to have a dialectical approach to fascism. You have to see it as a symptom of capitalist contradiction. You have to see it pointing beyond itself. Even fascism points beyond itself. And certainly, capitalist colonialism, imperialism, and the imperialist epoch of monopoly finance capital and the imperial capitalist state points beyond itself, or at least that's what Marxists used to think. Now, again, today, that's just a funny proposition. It's like, I don't know what, is it hand-waving? What are people going to throw at me next, you know? Well, we have to make it into that, right? That's really the issue. It's not just that. And Lenin was writing and living in a time when there were millions of workers in the metropolitan capitalist countries organized for the struggle for socialism. We don't have that now. So we can't treat our current situation as the highest stage of capitalism as a result. All right. And so my my final sort of extension of the question, Happy65 asked in the chat, can someone in the chat briefly explain what he means by defending it will destroy it? And I feel like that actually is something that maybe you could touch on. And then we'll close out this segment. Oh, well, but the but the US, for example, and Western Europe were destroying their own societies and cultures in the Cold War. I mean, kind of obviously. Mm-hmm. You know? And uh, I mean, you know, Dorno famously said that he was less concerned about the threat of like fringe fascist groups, and he was more concerned about the inherent fascism within liberal democracy. And you know. What did that mean? It meant LBJ is America, you know, it meant uh, the U.S. war in Vietnam, of course, is Mm -hmm. like a path to political authoritarianism in the United States. But again, the right wing, there would be a right wing critique, right? The right wing critique would be America should never have become an empire. It became an empire in the Cold War. It became an empire winning the Cold War. It should never have gone down that path. But the, the, the Marxist approach is but there were objective conditions that led the U.S. down that path. It's not just a bad, bad moral choice. And that's, by the way, where Rock Hill leaves things. Rock Hill leaves things at the level of the morality of the intellectual. It's not about that. It's not about the morality of the intellectual. It's not about what the intellectual should or should not think or should or should not write or should or should not do. It's about, can we recognize the task of socialism and its possibility, its imminent possibility within capitalism? It's not about, read this, don't read that. It's not about, ooh, Nietzsche is a forbidden text, dangerous ideas. No. There's nothing particularly dangerous there. There are a lot more dangerous ideas than Nietzsche, I can tell you. And even then, so what, right? That's not the point. The point is not like to set up thought taboos, to use an Adorno phrase. So right. Rock Hill is a thought taboo. He's a dogmatization and thought taboo guy to the max, right? 
Even if he wasn't an actual Stalinist, he would still be a Stalinist. The Trotskyists are also like this. Okay. Okay. All right. And the anarchist academic intellectuals are also this. They are all dogma and thought taboo. No, <laughs> we don't need that. Thank you, Chris. We'll be right back right after this. Chris Catrone is teaching a course, Intro to Marxism, throughout the month of October 2024 here at Theory Underground. Theory Underground subscribers get half off if you're interested in the subscriptions. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, a place for workers with earbuds who are tired of letting others read and think on their behalf, slipstreaming our way into an understanding of the situation that short circuits the deadlocks of our moment. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right this is the mark. Theory Underground is coming to a city near you. What that has meant in the last year is traveling across the United States, into Canada, and then all over Europe to promote our books, courses, and ideas related to time energy and underground theory. You've been reading Underground Theory. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Okay, picture the scene. America, early 2021. An Amazon warehouse worker arises from the emerging underground theory internet scene to create spaces for untimely topics and concerns that are too often neglected or kept in isolation today. Joined by a revolving cast of underground theorists, academics and critics, he establishes what will become Theory Underground, a teaching, research and publishing platform by and for working class intellectuals, autodidacts and academics who want to do more than they're able to do within the confines of academia. That warehouse worker's name is David McCarricker and his book Time Energy is his first major contribution to the world of theory. It was recently reprinted with a foreword by none other than Slavoj Žižek, who also contributed to Theory Underground's latest book. Ah, ah, ah. My Bible, it's an excellent book. A collection of essays called Underground Theory. What you just heard is an excerpt from the Strange Exiles podcast, episode 23, where Bram from Strange Exiles interviewed me and Mikey. For those who don't know, Mikey is the author of the Dangerous Maybe blog. We are publishing one of his books here shortly at Theory Underground. He's also a lecturer at Theory Underground, and he's someone I've been friends and a collaborator with for over 10 years. But most importantly for you all, he's a fantastic lecturer, and it's a crime that he has to do wage labor right now. One of the long-term goals of Theory Underground has been now for a couple of years to hashtag free Mikey. That is something that I've been really pushing, but first I had to get freed from wage labor, which was achieved this year. That's right. Thanks to my monthly seminar subscribers, I was able to quit Amazon and do Theory Underground full time. Now I'm announcing the next big phase of the plan, which is the Mikey Down Seminar. What monthly subscribers to the Mikey Seminar are paying for is a survey of philosophy, including deep dives into Zizek, Land, Lacan, Baudrillard, Bataille, Leotard, and ultimately the whole history of philosophy. We're trying to build like this ongoing seminar, right? And that, that's what I really like about this thing, where, you know, if I'm teaching a main text, that's something I got to focus on. I got to really, but the seminar thing, we can do this stuff all the time, where we dive deeper into concepts, we dive deeper into certain you know sections of books or whatever and we can really do this nuanced stuff i think that there's probably no better way for us to accelerate our learning in these areas than by slipstreaming mikey and that has been my belief for years and years and years now it's official you're able to help out you're able to get involved you're able to benefit directly from liberating him from wage labor get on it right now do it J just go 
stop what you're doing go click the button subscribe that's this is what you do subscribe to him if you're already signed up for the ongoing theory underground seminars then that's the ones that i do with my wife and though that's getting an upgrade which means that i will be doing one session per month that is just me and then i will also be doing the ones with Anne which are a crash course in sociology, anthropology, the social sciences, and ultimately Marx, Heidegger, Levinas, Bourdieu, imminently critiquing pop psychology, sociology, self-help, and ultimately the doxa of our time. But if you would like to be a subscriber to both Mikey's seminar and the seminar that the Snellgrove McCarrickers are doing, then the best way is to become a tier four subscriber or you can be a tier two subscriber to each of us the reason this matters is because tier two is like pretty much the best bang for your buck it gives you huge discounts on all of the courses that we do but uh, if you can't afford it tier four is amazing because it gives you tier three access at both mikey's seminar and ours Finally, not everybody has time to be part of these ongoing research seminars, and they just want to fund the paid content for the YouTube and podcast. And so thank you so, so much to our patrons over at Patreon. They're the ones funding all the free stuff. So big thank you to Bert, Marilyn, Carl, Sahil, Zozandra, Nikolai, Darian, Tyler, and Mandeep, and all the other wonderful patron people, uh, pay Patreon people. And thank you to all the other wonderful Patreon people. And thank you to all the other wonderful Patreon people. Thank you so much to all of you patrons and also to the special subscribers and the paying subscribers. Oh my god! <laughs> it's just so awkward. Thank you Patreon. Patrons, thank you. Pa oh, okay. And to all the other wonderful patrons. Thank you so much all you patrons and also a special thanks to the subscribers on the YouTube side as well as the paying subscribers over at Substate. <laughs> Why can't we do this? <laughs> Fuck. You guys. Please. Just thank you. Thank you, everyone.